Thank you for joining our call. My name is Nalexia Galloway, and I'm the African American Phil representative for Congressman Ruben Gallego. Unfortunately, the Congressman could not join us tonight, but he has asked me to read a statement on his behalf, followed by our four presenters who will talk briefly about domestic violence, warning signs of mental health, and when to get help, what children need during a crisis, and resources for our communities. Then we will answer the pre submitted questions. Again, you can begin asking your questions at any time. For those questions we don't get to, our office will follow up with you. And of course, you can always reach, reach out to us. The contact information is listed on the screen. If you visit the Congre Congressman's website, you will also find a variety of resources. Again, unfortunately, Congressman Ruben Gallego could not join us, but asked me to read the following statement. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we're also several months into a pandemic that has brought unique challenges. Life looks different these days, and the social distance that is so necessary to keep us all healthy and safe can also take a huge toll. It was important to me that we organize this webinar today so that we can discuss those challenges and provide resources for anyone who might feel like they need a little extra help during these times. Or for anyone who might have a friend or a family member that needs some support or guidance. COVID-19 and our response to it has brought on many new challenges. It's safest right now to stay home, but staying home can be isolating for those without the support of family or friends to rely on. And it can be downright dangerous for people who are being abused by someone they are living with. And as if things couldn't be harder, other problems in our society haven't stopped or slowed. Last week, three of our neighbors were shot in Glendale on one of their first nights out as our state reopened. And earlier this week, George Floyd was murdered by a police officer and the entire thing was captured on tape. The officer was fired, but that was not enough. He should be prosecuted and held accountable. Black parents are once again having to warn their children that the world is not the same for them and they will be targeted just for the color of their skin. And too many white parents are refusing to have conversations about race and privilege and even basic human decency with their own children. Even in the middle of a pandemic, the divides are still too harsh and too real and too deadly. It's no wonder so many people are at a breaking point right now. And that's why it was so important to me today to gather people who can provide a little extra help and guidance for those who need it most. We're joined today by some experts who will provide resources meant to help you preserve and improve your own mental health or to help you provide assistance to family members or friends who are struggling. I can tell you firsthand how important it is to reach out to others when you need that help or sometimes just to hear that help is available to you if you need it. I'm not shy about the fact that I needed that help when I came home from Iraq. I experienced death and loss in a way I never had, and the things I saw and lived through left a lasting mark. I struggled with PTSD, and many of the men and women I served with went through the same. The reality is that there's a stigma involved when it comes to mental health struggles and too many people are ashamed to reach out to get the help they need. I'm hoping that this webinar today helps even a little to reduce that stigma and that when we can come together to acknowledge that we all have our own struggles and hurts and fears and pains, but that there are people who want to help in ways we can lean on each other to make it even a little bit easier, a little bit better. I want to remind you that all my staff is always here to help you. You can reach them at 602-256-0551 and let us know what you need. At this moment, I'd also like to take a moment of silence for George Floyd. Thank you. We have a lot of great presenters today. Our first presenter will be Melda Ojeda. 
she will be discussing PTSD and mental health in the Latino community. Amelda is a social worker, immigrant, and a community servant with years of experience working in the social and behavioral health systems. She is a nonprofit professional, an intervention therapist for family re reunification cases, and an instructor for the School of Social Work. Amelda, please take it away. Hi everyone, thank you for inviting me and, and bringing light to all these important topics. Um, as you mentioned, I will be talking about PTSD, uh, which stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. And usually when humans or persons in general experience a traumatic event, uh, we go through a range of emotions that are normal to feel. Uh, we can feel scared, anxious, sad, disconnected, even numb. Um, we might have bad dreams, fear, uh, be very fearful, um, and we might have problems, um, stop thinking about the traumatic event. Uh, and these are all normal reactions to abnormal events or traumatic events. Um, and eventually, uh, these feelings start fading away within weeks or uh, days or weeks, um, sometimes might even take months. Um, but the problem comes when um, these feelings and these symptoms don't go away after a long period of time, after a few months or even a year, we're still experiencing these this symptoms and they might even get worse instead of, instead of fading away. Um, this is when we develop PTSD uh, based on the traumatic event that we experience. Um, and it's important to note that um, a traumatic experience doesn't necessarily have to happen to you directly for you to develop PTSD. Um, you can be the witness of, uh, of a crime of violence. Um, you can be a family member who is witnessing domestic violence, uh, you know, your parents or another family member in the household um, who is experiencing domestic violence um, or even emergency workers. Um, nurses, uh, doctors, law enforcement who respond, the first responders to, to these traumatic events. So it's important to know that um, even if you were not the person who experienced firsthand the traumatic event, you can still uh, develop all the symptoms and have PTSD in the long run. Um, so how do we know when we are experiencing PTSD uh, beyond the normal uh, the typical range of, of symptoms after an event. Um, we might continue re-experiencing the traumatic event, memories, flashbacks, nightmares, um, uh, intense uh, physical reactions to something that triggers that, that memory, uh, coming, you know, coming back to the place or hearing a specific noise that we attach it to, to the event or the trauma. Um, we might start avoiding, avoiding people that remind us of the event. We start avoiding places, music, foods, anything that we correlate with, with a traumatic event. Um, these are all things that could be happening uh, and, and symptoms of that we might be experiencing PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, changes and mood and changes in, in, in any, any big changes of um, sleeping patterns or eating patterns more than the, the, the typical um, grieving process after a traumatic event. So these are all things to, to be attentive, um, especially when we believe that a family member has experienced um, a traumatic event and they might be developing PTSD. Um, it's important to note as well that children might express PTSD in a different way. Um, children might be fearful of being separated from their parent. Um, they might, uh, instead of moving forward with their development, they might go back to stages of their development. Like, let's say they, they were potty trained already and they experienced a traumatic event, they might um, go back to, you know, wetting the bed and, and soiling their pants. Um, so they start, you know, their development starts, um, I guess, pausing uh, for a little bit. Uh, they have sleep problems, nightmares, uh, phobias that they didn't have before. So it's important to 
to pay attention to these things, um, especially when we talk about domestic violence and the, and the effect of domestic violence in children as well. Um, they might start talking about mon monsters under the bed or any other uh, fear of ghosts or any, any other um, similar entity that they, that they feel that it's, it's going to hurt them. Um, so what can we do? You know, what can we do when we see the signs that a family member or someone that we love, a friend, might be suffering from PTSD? Um, you know, of course, uh, as mental health professionals, we always encourage people to get connected to um, mental health resources, to talk to your doctor, uh, to get a referral for a mental health professional evaluation. Uh, but we know that not everyone has access to this and not everyone has access to um, insurance or the means to get connected to services in their area. Um, so if you know of someone in your family is experiencing these things, uh, be patient, you know, um, telling them to just get over it or invalidating their experience is not going to make it go away. Um, listening to what they have to share, even if it's they're repeating the same stories, um, it's just sitting with them and making space for them and listening. Um, you can invite them to do regular things, uh, not necessarily something out of the ordinary, but just joining you to do your regular activities during the day uh, to feel that they that there's someone there with them. Um, encourage them to join a support group, to find uh, a group on Facebook or social media where they might yeah, be connected with other people who have gone through similar things. Um, and talk to someone you trust. You know, talking therapy not necessarily has to be uh, in a professional setting. Sometimes when we express our feelings and talk about what's going on, um, it makes it more tangible and easier to process. Um, and of course, you know, avoiding alcohol and drugs or getting into any of those activities that might create an addiction. Um, sometimes when we talk about the Latino community, especially the population that I work with, um, there are a lot of obstacles or taboos um, in seeking help. Um, so it's something to, it's important to remind um, the families that we work with is that just because we don't talk about it, it's not going to go away. So highly encourage people to talk to your friends and family and let them know what you're going through. Um, there are some resources that I would like to share um, about you know, connecting people with some local resources. Um, the Arizona Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual, Sexual Violence. Um, and you can find more information on the website, acesdv.org. Um, and I'll share the, the links as well, so you can send them on the, on the, on the email. Uh, and the lo local hotline, which is 602-279 2980 and we'll share some of those resources as well so everyone has it handy. I think so far that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Melda. I definitely appreciate the information um, that you um, presented to us. I just want to remind you guys that if you do have any questions, please um, submit them throughout the process so that we can have them um, at the end during our Q&A uh, session. The next presenter that we have up is Debbie Nez Manuel. Debbie is a social worker that fearlessly advocates for social justice. She recognizes our capacity for humaneness starts with the balance on social, emotional, and mental wellness. Debbie has served in both urban, rural, and remote settings in Arizona on the Navajo Nation, Flagstaff, and in the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. Debbie, it's all you. Thank you so much um, for making this possible. I, I see the, that it's so valuable more than ever uh, right now during this pandemic. And um, I um, have talked um, endlessly about this with my, my own family and what we need to do to cope and um, move from grieving to a place where our minds and our hearts are settled. And um, I think that when I think about our families, I think about in, our, in a framework, a really positive framework is to understand that we are resilient. There's a lot of opportunities for us to um, for us to uh, learn from one another and um, help each other cope. So um, I'm going to share this information in the context of resiliency. 
and understanding that when we focus on the positive, we can definitely shift into a place where our mindset is much healthier and, and holistically it's much stronger. So um, I, I grew up on, on the tribal nation and I have these really rural and remote experiences that I draw from and uh, they include this traditional mindset and this holistic mindset, which often can be um, very different than what we experience, say, in a, in a Western hospital setting. Um, but, you know, some things are the same, you know, they're, we're, we're humans and we're thinking about the fact that um, as humans, there are certain things we have to do. Um, we, we cope in different ways, but our emotions are a big part of that. And so when I'm educating the public, I'm talking a lot about our emotions and where we're at. Um, in order to really understand what tribes are, are facing today during this pandemic, um, it's really about um, learning about them, learning about the history, learning about some of the challenges they're facing when it comes to their own um, services, their own um, service delivery capacities, um, understanding if they have a lifeline to other major resources that are going to help people in the community. So if you look at tribal communities, uh, in general, they have an Indian health services that is available to them. There's also um, behavioral health services that are included in, in those settings as well as mental health. And often um, there's contract services where they can reach out to other agencies throughout either the, the local area or the regional area. And so when I think about children and what they needed from adults during a crisis, it's really a listening ear. It's trusting someone will give them at least a realistic picture of what's to be expected. Um, I think children function on a much higher level when you give them um, an idea of what's gonna happen. They also are more receptive and they often will uh, be more in, engaged in the instructions you're gonna give them. If, if it's going down the road you know, to visit somebody, you know, if we go into a house, this is who we're gonna visit, this is what we're gonna see, this is what we'll probably do there and this is about how long it'll be. People, humans in general, will function better with that. Um, and so this, this idea of describing what's going to happen paints a picture for children. Um, and it, when I think about adolescence, um, that's a little bit um, older age. And we think about, you know, this picture is even more crucial than sometimes they have um, this, this need to be autonomous, to be really independent, to make their own decisions. And those are things that as parents, as caregivers, we have to really think about. Our, our children in that context. Um, but being able to express love to them and honesty about what's gonna happen, you know, what to expect, even our own fears, either as parents, as caregivers, or as, um, as community members, we have to talk about uh, and express what that might look like. I think the other thing is it's important to look for clues. Um, if our kids are not doing well, they leave uh, breadcrumbs. You know, we should be paying attention to those breadcrumbs. Um, we should be looking for any kind of potential misunderstanding that our children are, are, are dealing with. And um, I, I think sometimes when, if someone's in our home and they're not feeling well, we're going to pay a lot of attention to them and we're going to forget that these, uh, these other young children are in the room. It's important to reframe discussion. I think when kids start to talk, they, they begin to come really anxious and um, immediately as caregivers, providers, you know, we wanna jump in and, and interrupt. We really need to listen. Listen um, closely and intentionally and reframe what it is that they're very concerned about. I think that when we look at it in this framework, we can quickly identify that there's opportunities to understand what stage of grief they're in, what kind of, st what stage of change they're in. Um, and, and those are gonna be really different. Sometimes they're gonna be really, um, really low key about their, their situation, but sometimes they're really acute and will be dealing with um, some situations where it's really chronic. Sadly, in tribal communities, the, the issues of suicide rates are extremely high. So one of the things that we want to do is make sure we're, we're paying attention to that, um, the chronic or the mild or, or moderate levels of um, depression that people are dealing with. If we can do this, we in our tribal communities, we're always saying that there, we can restore balance and we can go forward and we can build this community. Here in Maricopa County, we have about five agencies that work with tribal communities. 
there's the Phoenix Indian Center, there's the Native American Connections, there's the um, Native Health Programs, and a lot of the local um, programs that are just affiliated with the county in general. Uh, I'll be here available to help answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate that information. And I also want to thank the participants for already submitting questions. I just want to encourage you guys to continue submitting those questions for our Q&A session um, later on in the webinar. Um, up next, we have um, Bruce Franks, Jr. He is a senior advisor for Generation Progress. As a former Missouri State Representative for the 78th District, Bruce helped pass legislation bringing awareness to mental health. He has worked with police departments on CIT trainings, addressing how to handle mental health on calls. Take it away, Bruce. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I want to I want to speak particularly about mental health in the Black community, um, which also resonates with many of our minority communities. You've heard before about the stigma of mental health. And I appreciate the congressman's remarks um, because it spoke to a lot of the things that we are dealing with um, today as, you know, our black community, um, particularly, but communities of color um, in America. But the thing about the thing about mental health and the stigma of it in a black community is we, we haven't talked about it. Uh, we haven't talked about it because for so long we've been uneducated about it and you talk about um, generational, uh, generational trauma, generational PTSD, generational uh, depression and anxiety um, that has been there since the beginning of time, um, but we haven't had the means to address it. And even when you look at the numbers and the statistics, when it comes to getting the help um, and identifying uh, exactly what we're dealing with when it comes to undiagnosed mental health issues, uh, that disparity is is you know, it's horrifying. Um, historical adversity, which includes uh, slavery, sharecropping, race-based exclusion from health, educational, social, and economic resources, um, translates into socioeconomic disparities experienced by uh, Black folks today. Um, when you think about people who are impoverished, uh, homeless, incarcerated, uh, who have substance abuse problems, we are all at higher risk uh, for poor mental health. One of the biggest disparities that we have is that um, when you come to black and brown communities, there are, there are, we have the least amount of resources. Um, one in three black folks uh, who experience mental health will actually get help. That's 33% uh, of folks who will actually get the help. I, I think the presenters before for talking about those uh, those identifiers and those indicators. In order to fix an issue, in order to fix a problem, we first have to identify what the problem is. Um, I think us who deal with mental health, me being a person who comes from um, a lived experience, part of mental health um, and what I've dealt with just the past couple years. Uh, my brother was killed in 1991. Um, he It was due to gun violence. And I grew up people telling me that I was too young to be depressed. I was too young to be going through anxiety. Um, and I, I really thank Debbie for her comments about the youth, right, and understanding uh, the youth and what they go through. And even as we talked about PTSD beforehand, we talked about our service members, our first responders, um, those folks who are on the front lines who experience PTSD. Um, which, which I support them as well. Um, but we also have to talk about our folks in the, our, our communities that experience um, so many disparities that suffer from gun violence, um, that are impacted most of, by gun violence and violence in our communities every day. Um, we have our children, we have our folks in those communities who are going through PTSD um, each and every day. And when you look at the signs the warning signs of PTSD, of anxiety, of depression, they all resonate with each other. As said before, um, when you talk about um, loss of interest, loss of hope, um, difference in sleeping habits, difference in eating habits, um, you know, fluctuation of weight, um, and then just the, just the mentality of um, there is no hope there. Another thing that we don't talk about in, in the Black community is uh, suicide rates. 
when I was growing up, to be quite frank, um, it was in my community, they said, black folks don't commit suicide. I am 35 years old now, and it took me um, over 32 years to figure out uh, mental health is real in our community, suicide is real in our community. Um, and also even the facts say that although um, our black community doesn't attempt suicide, um, as much as uh, other communities that are non-Black. Uh, we are almost 7%, have a 7% higher chance of, of actually dying from that suicide. And so understanding that suicide is real, understanding that mental health is real um, in the Black community and those disparities are there. When you talk about um, access to healthcare, when you talk about access, those who are uninsured, um, our black community, almost 7% higher um, of folks who are uninsured um, when it comes to, to just the health system as a whole. Uh, when it comes to resources, um, you can, I'm in Arizona now, um, and I thank the Congressman and his office for this webinar, and you can definitely reach out to them. Um, but also just having that conversation and figuring out uh, folks that you can talk to and you can confide in um, because mental health in the black community is real. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate um, appreciate your remarks. Um, up next, we have Christian Nunez. Christian is the vice president um, for the National Organization of Women. She is a licensed clinical social worker, a consultant, and a woman minority business owner. In 2006, she founded a behavioral health and consulting practice where she assists social service and behavioral health companies, as well as provide direct mental health services to individuals and families. Christian, it's all you. Thank you, Alexia. Um, and just I want to give a thanks to other panelists as well who have spoken and gave some great insight um, and information. Um, before I start getting more into the discussion, I'm honored to be a part of this panel uh, talking about uh, domestic violence in the Black and Brown communities, particularly during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but what I would first like to say is that domestic violence is not a Black and Brown issue only. Um, anyone can ex anyone and everyone experiences domestic violence in their racial groups um, or any home. However, when we look at structural racism and we look at disparities in health, disparities in our neighborhoods, we see that sometimes women of color, particularly, are more susceptible to intimate partner violence um, in death as well as injury from those violences um, because of lots of other statistical things that happen that put them in more risk. But everyone and anyone can experience domestic violence or intimate partner violence. So what we're seeing right now is that um, we know that one in three women is, are victims of domestic violence. And I'm gonna interchange domestic violence and intimate partner violence because they kind of the nuance between the two. Domestic violence is anyone from a family um, so it could be your partner, or it could be your child, it could be a grandparent, anyone a family comes in. And then we have an intimate partner which really focuses more on the dating romantic relationship part of it. But when we are looking at this, we really want to talk about the fact that we already, before COVID-19, had one in three women experience domestic violence or intimate partner violence, and one in four children be victims of child abuse, including sexual abuse. And what we're seeing now is that individuals, survivors, are victims of violence or having to stay at home um, due to stay at home orders that are taking place because of this pandemic. And they're being forced to be at home with their abusers. And what we know is that abuse, domestic violence, is about power and control. And so can you imagine being in a position where before you were already experiencing types of abuse, um, but you had outlets, you could leave, you could go over to a friend's house, get a break, you can go to work, or you had some type of escape. The children had school. And now we're in a position where we're all in to get home shelter positions, um, although those are starting to let up, and we have individuals that are now experiencing domestic violence at higher rates. A lot of research has come out, it says that since uh, COVID-19, we're seeing over between a 30 and 60% increase rate, depending on the state, 
and domestic violence uh, shelters being overfilled, uh, hotline calls, um, people being victims of abuse, um, and also the severity of abuse is also increasing. Um, we talk about mental health, we're talking about children, we're talking about all these things. And when you put a person in a situation where they are stuck at home and all they have is to deal with the person who they don't want to be with because they're fearful for their life, or the person's abusing them, people have lost jobs, children at home, um, finances are stressed because we know the employment rate's higher right now, unemployment rate's higher, and we're seeing stress and anxiety in everyone because of the unknown and not knowing. So then we're looking at the abuser who thrives off of power and control. And right now they're unable to be in control of their own situation. So that's gonna escalate them as well to wanting to also um, act out on the victims of abuse and their partners um, to have them regain more control in some ways. So it's really important that we talk to the people and we keep relationships with our friends and families. And for those of the individuals that are experiencing this abuse, it's important to develop safety plans um, that can really help you in this time. We know that people are afraid of being uh, contracting COVID-19. We know that shelters are having to turn people away because they are filled to the max. And they also have to worry about social distancing. But as family and friends, who are people that we know, it's important that we stay in communication with people that we either have concern with or that we know things are going on. And for people who are experiencing it, form your safety plan. Identify family members or friends that you can go to if, if it gets too bad and you need to escape your home. Think about places that you can go that are safe for you. Carry with you a place where you have certain things important like your cell phone and medications and money or different things that you need that can be available if you have to escape your home. It's extremely important. So I just, and you know, as well as just making sure that you are utilizing the um, people around you and different resources that you have that can be helpful for you. We know it's hard. We know it's difficult. Um, but people, you're not alone in the situation and there are resources available that you can call in numbers and text lines. And I did send a list of resources that are available in Arizona throughout the state um, for anyone who might need those resources. So um, it's very limited time, but I just wanted to give that quick information um, and then I'll pass back over to Alexia. Thank you, Christian. I certainly appreciate it. I know that we um, covered a lot of different information in a very short period of time. And so I just want to encourage you guys to go ahead and keep submitting your questions um, so that um, we can get to them. If we cannot, we will definitely follow up with you as I know the time um, will quickly pass by. Um, at this time, we will now begin our Q&A portion for the call, and I ask that you continue to submit your question. Um, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, some participants have already pre-submitted questions, and we will start with those first. Then we will move on to the questions presently being submitted. So we will get started with our first question um, that was submitted. Melda, this question is going to be for you. What do you do when you are the one experiencing PTSD and everywhere you try and reach out to, you end up hitting a brick wall? Where can you turn at that point? Yeah, this is a, a common question and common um, concern that, you know, people in the community experience, especially when uh, they reach out to social services agencies and local hospitals. Um, I, I will have to, you know, look at the individual needs of the person and where they have reached out. But um, generally, I will say, you know, don't, I know it might feel frustrating, but um, don't give up. Um, you have already started the first, the first you know, trying to look for help. Um, I, like I mentioned during the, during my, my section, um, I reach out to people and either it's on social media that are experiencing something similar to you, uh, community groups, uh, local community groups and support groups. And they might be, they might be a really good resource for, 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 for to let you know where to go, where they have received assistance, where they have 
received um, counseling that has been effective for them. Um, so support groups and, and connecting with people that are going through similar things um, as you, it's, it's a really good start point uh, because you will be able to get feedback on resources and services uh, locally from someone who has already gone through that and has already navigated those um, the, the field and and troubleshooting um, so connecting with people who who might be going through the same thing and social media is a gate as a great resource to connecting with other people in that way Thank you, Melda. Mm -hmm. The next question is going to be for Debbie. Debbie, the question is, how has COVID-19 impacted the Native American community? It really depends on the nation that you're looking at, um, but in general, there's been a lot of challenges that um, tribes face um, in rural Arizona um, when it comes to um, sanitize, sanitizing, having access to water, um, and just ensuring that tribes have the capacity to distribute all of the resources that are needed. Um, but when you look at the urban area here, you know, some of these co tribal communities are just within this urban area, so they have water. Um, in, in the cases where in the urban area, what we're looking at is making sure we re keep those numbers reduced uh, and in recognizing that these tribal nations have higher rates of diabetes, um, heart disease, asthma issues, um, and that those are, um, those, the mix that with the vi issue of the virus, it creates a really complex situation. So right now, from what I could see, a lot of the urban nations are ensuring that they do everything they can to maintain their safety, wearing masks, um, ensuring that they're watching out for their elders and, and practicing the social distancing. Um, that's, that's kind of what I've seen in the area. Thank you, Debbie. Mm -hmm. Christian, the next question is for you. What can I do if I know a loved one is in a domestic violence home and needs help? Well, I think the best thing that you can do for someone you know is stay in constant contact with them. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier, you know, people's living quarters are closer, abusers are around um, their victims and survivors more. So it's sometimes harder for them to be able to get away or even make the initial phone call. But if you can stay in contact and do checks, you know, and ask them how they're doing, whether it's through other avenues, let's like text messaging or mess um, Facebook messaging, anything that's allowing them to be able to have privacy conversations where you can do checks, develop safe words with them so that they know um, if something gets too bad, they can tell you this word and you know when to intervene or call police or to assist them where it keeps them safe and this person, the user will not know. Um, I think those are the best things that you really can do to help them and, you know, open and be willing to offer that space or home if they need that from you. Thank you, Christian. Bruce, the next question is for you. With the current events happening in Black America being so triggering, what can we do, if anything? Um, um, as it relates to mental health, um, being honest, we don't know. Um, I wish I could give some great answer. I wish I can give some resource, but we don't know. As I said before, we are talking about generational trauma and treatment of black folks and, and minorities and people of color for years and years and years. And it continues to happen, no, many, no matter how many strides we've made. And so it's hard to say that, um, hard to even talk about what we can do. Um, as far as those activists and those folks who are on the front line and who are fighting every day um, out there, you know, around these issues, I think one thing we could do is um, recognize that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to take a step back. Um, I know self-care, and I know it's hard to take care of yourself when, when you you know, throw yourself into the work and this is what you do and this is what you love to do because, you know, you represent your people and, and you're doing what's right. Uh, but it's okay to not be okay and, and take a step back, even if for just a second to breathe. Uh, 
but yeah, I don't, I don't have a, I wish I had some cliche answer to give, but given the, the current events and what's happened, um, I don't know. Thank you. The next question is going to be for anyone. Um, the last few questions have been directly targeted to um, people of color, the color um, population. And so mental health is just not a um, people of color issue. So what do you say to um, the individual that says, well, I'm struggling with mental health, but it's not for a specific issue. What advice would you have for um, those individuals? Uh, this is Debbie. I think it's important to, you know, add it, uh, kind of adding on to what Bruce is saying. It's, it's okay to admit that. I think that's the most important thing is to acknowledge that, you know, there, there is a disconnect there. And um, often when we're disconnected emotionally, um, we're also going to be detached from the local resources. Um, it's good to turn to somebody that you trust that you know is going to take some time to listen to you and get you to get you connected to some of the resources that are that are available. I um, too often um, when 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 we're going through mental health issues, we we don't really we really need to spend a lot of time understanding what coping mechanisms are, what works for us, because some of that coping, while it might work for other people, it may not wor always work for us. And um, our brains are wired so differently. Um, we just have this innate blueprint that's there and we just have to figure out what that is so that we can get to the next step. But connecting to somebody that you trust and that is willing to take time with you um, to connect to you is really important. I think, I think just to really piggyback real quick off what Debbie said, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, also um, something that um, Melda said earlier about not minimizing that experience, um, making sure that we are listening and no matter what it is they're saying, uh, to let them know that, that you are that ear. Um, all too often we give our own diagnosis of the problem and, and we wanna give what we think. And a lot of times it's just, it's just good for us to take a step back and listen as far as that part of communication. So not minimizing that experience, even actually hearing somebody out. Um, yeah, and I think what Debbie and Bruce are saying is, is right on. I would just like to add also, I think it's really important for anyone um, experiencing mental health is to do a little self-care, but pay attention and start identifying your own triggers um, in journaling and writing down what you're experiencing, what might set your mood off for the day, if anything set your mood off for the day, what you're feeling, what's going through your mind. Um, and then reach out to those services that are available to you. Right now, telemedicine and telehealth is really available for most people um, if they cannot get out of their home to get counseling services. But just by being able to chart and track your own symptoms, how you're feeling, what was going through your mind at the time, what triggered you, what happened that day, it'll be helpful for you as well to start paying attention to your own, to, you know, help with your healing. And then when you take that to a therapist or someone, then you can also help them work with you on how to be able to cope with those different triggers if you cannot escape those triggers and how to deal with them differently. Um, I think it's really important. And the other part is just self-care and that's taking care of yourself. As Imelda said earlier, I believe with PTSD, you know, making sure you're not overusing, consuming substances, um, caffeine, alcohol, drugs, um, even overeating too is also considered like um, something where we're over consuming things, making sure you're getting enough sleep, making sure that you're doing your own healthy self-care practices, whether that might be meditation or prayer, jogging, taking a walk, anything that's gonna help you increase those, um, those endorphins that are gonna be important for your mood um, will be helpful for you as well. So I just encourage you to kind of look at those things that work for you as Debbie was saying, it's different for all of us, but you know what works for you when you're feeling down, just putting on like that music that uplifts you or if it's saying a prayer, or if it's meditating, or if it's taking a walk, or if it's calling a friend. Utilize those things that are within your capacity and, and within your area and your level, I think will be really helpful for you as well. Thank you, Christian. The next question is from Laura Lee. Her question is, what are some ways to help my son 
who is diagnosed with schizophrenia and consistently takes his prescribed medications, but only wants to stay in his bed. When not in his bed, he smokes cigarettes. He does not want to participate in any of his outpatient group workshops. Um, it might be that he's not ready yet to participate in those group exercises. Um, you know, as, as we were talking about coping mechanisms, um, what works for one person might not work for someone else. So I think uh, acknowledging that he, he's actually taking his medication. So he's, he's doing a big step already in, in addressing the symptoms, um, and just encouraging him to, to continue taking his medication. So highlighting what he is doing right now and the steps that he that he's doing uh, to to help himself. Um, it might be, you know, very, uh, uh, um, like I said, he might not be ready to participate in those groups and share and in a bigger uh, group or, or setting with, with other people around. Um, or it might be that, you know, the going to getting to those places, um, the transportation issue or anxiety um, regarding uh, driving or going getting in a bus or, um, you know, just making himself um, going to to the outpatient services, it might not be what works for him. So maybe having uh, um, services at home, someone that can come and talk to him at home, um, just tailoring the services that he's getting to meet um, his current needs. And with st instead of trying to have him do what um, a typical treatment looks like, because it looks different for everyone. And just to pick a yak for what Amal was saying, um, I think it's really important too to sometimes ask that person what they're willing to do. You know, having schizophrenia, it's a serious um, chronic illness and it's different spaces of it. And I Melba hit it right on the head when she's saying, where is he at? You know, what is he willing to do? Um, and I think for you as a parent, you know, ask yourself some questions. Is he safe? You know, is he safe? Is he doing what he needs to do to stay regulated? And that's taking his medication, you know, and then figure out from there, like have a crisis plan, you know? So if there are things where a certain point that you know it's problematic that you don't want to get to get him to, you all sit down and identify what that is and have him work with you and saying, you know, mom, this is, if I get to this point, you know, then I need you to intervene a little bit better. But giving them, let them empower themselves a little bit, because if he's an adult, you know, just to be able to say to him, what is it that you're willing to do? What are you willing to do that, you know, that, that you're at your level um, that will keep you safe? And, and I think safety is a big part, as long as there's no risk mm -hmm. issue, giving him the ability to be autonomous and uh, empowered in himself is going to be super important as well. And I'd, I'd like to just add in as well, um, it, I, it wasn't said whether or not um, you're the old, only parent or the sole parent being the caregiver. I think when often when uh, parents are the sole caregiver, that can be really challenging because your, your, your day as a parent is, is, can be overwhelming. But um, I, I agree that, you know, understanding where, where he's at when it comes to his place, you know, his mindset about healing about getting services and and that really falls under the stage of change um, when we're going through this process we can we we, we kind of creep in it, it's not any different than parents trying to um, decrease smoking or eating or changing habits we all go through this process and our children go through it too but um, if there's a need to get some support as a parent, um, there's res respite care, there's ways to reduce some of that so that um, as we're parenting, we're coming in with a really thoughtful mindset in a place where, where we have a lot more patience. And I liked um, what uh, Christine was saying about the safety plan and uh, in a high crisis situation, how do we handle that? And, and giving him permission to be able to speak up and say, you know what, this is not working, we need to go to plan B. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. The next question is, do we know if children returning back to school from back to school coming from domestic violent environments is or has been addressed by anyone or the school districts? 
You know, I think that's an excellent question. And I can't really answer that because I'm not sure what's going on in Arizona. <laughs> um, but I will say that it's an important conversation to be, to be had. And I think it's important to reach out to your school board members and the admin staff of those schools and ask them those questions, how they plan on preparing for those kids, because there will be some adjustments. Um, and, and I think for all the kids, especially kids with experience in domestic violence in the home, but even kids in general, because anxiety and fear is really heightened in children right now and adolescents. So there will be definitely some needed supports and services, but I would definitely reach out to your school districts, um, school board members, um, administration, and kind of ask them their plan and their contingency plan for returning back to school for the kids. I think in school settings, it's also really important to advocate for uh, um, for the increased communication. Um, I know some of the schools are really good at sending messages, voice messages, um, email, uh, but in, in particular, when it comes to our youth, we really have to understand that if they are um, experiencing, uh, you know, an environment where there's violence or or higher stress levels, they're at the age where they can they can take off on their own. They also deal with higher rates of depression. So we need to be mindful and pay attention to the clues that they're leaving um, and, and increasing the safety plan for those young people that they can turn to somebody else in the home. And this is about cultivating that really trusting relationship with parents to say, you know, mom, if, if mom or dad, if something happens, you know, if I did, if I take off, this is where I'm going to be, you know, building and cultivating that trust in between a parent and a child is important. Um, I totally agree. And just to add, uh, this is also the importance of advocating for uh, trauma informed care as far as training um, within our schools um, for our administrators to actually be able to identify um, and help through um, that trauma that the youth might be going through at home or in their communities um, and, and making sure they know the warning signs, making sure they know um, what to say, what to ask, um, and how to deal with uh, as well. Thank you, Bruce. Um, time is uh, winding down, so I will go ahead and we'll do two more questions, two more brief questions, um, and then that will conclude our Q&A session. The first of the last question, first of the last two questions is, what is being done to ensure continuing mental and behavioral health care given the pandemic? Um, I, I serve on the board for Arizona Humanities and I, um, we have been a part of a decision-making process ensuring that we get funding out to communities. And um, there's been um, a number of applications that we're reviewing. So I can see the, the state people applying for this funding and that's a big part of their, their, um, um, their work that they're doing, not, not just for the, the consumers or the public, but also for their employees. So there's a lot of ways that um, I, I see innovation happening um, and I think it's really important. So this, these emergency fundings that are available, we really have to take advantage of those. We need to apply for that funding and make it available for the people we serve and also the, you know, the employees that, that serve those people. Um, I think that's a really good opportunity to pursue, pursue those grants. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question is, um, there are many people in the community that are trying to receive mental health services and they're not having any luck. Um, are there any free counseling resources for people who are not on access and they can't afford a copay? Uh, yes, there is a, what, there, if you go to Arizona DES, I think it's az.gov, um, they have a list of different resources under different topics. One is mental health. Um, there are free clinics out there that do provide some services. Um, they do have them in Arizona, I know for sure. Um, there are some universities that provide discounted services, counseling services for individuals who don't have insurance or underinsured. Um, and a lot of clinics provide sliding fee scales um, for individuals to come and, and get services if they are, um, and people are, persons are in need. 
And I would also sometimes ask therapists if they're willing to pro bono. I'm in, I know when I was in Arizona, I took quite a few pro bono cases for individuals at times when I knew that they really needed that help. Um, you know, and so that, that does happen. Therapists do do pro bono as well. And all you, all you have to do is really just be willing to ask and find out and definitely contact even the Medicaid services and ask them, you know, can they route you to the free clinics where they do exist. Thank you, Christian. That's all the time we have for questions. At this time, I'd like to invite the panelists to give any final remarks, um, real brief remarks, 30 seconds to a minute. We'll start with Melda, then we'll have Debbie, followed by Bruce, and then Christian. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for bringing light to all this uh, very important subjects, um, especially now that everyone is experiencing some level of crisis or stress and trauma. Um, it is very important to talk about this. And, you know, we, we talk often about um, professional mental health services, but also um, our communities can really benefit from informal uh, mental health services. And, you know, we have all talked about things that make us feel good and people that we reach out to that can sit down with us and make space for us and listen to what we're going through. Doesn't always have to look, um, you know, sitting in a couch, talking to a counselor uh, in a professional setting. Uh, there are a lot of support groups and community organizations that you can reach out to and, and have that sense of community and connection with other people who are going through a similar situation. Um, and right now in times of, of this pandemic going on and just our stress is, is increasing, um, connect to your friends and family. Those are the people who know you the best and the ones that you can trust the more and, um, Sometimes just talking to someone and putting it out there um, helps reduce that stress and helps put it, you know, out on the table. So that way we can figure it out a way to address these issues together. So um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this. I'm glad that um, we are having these open conversations and I uh, appreciate Representative Gallego and the staff for, for pulling this together. And I think that, um, you know, adding on about um, the framework of resiliency, we are resilient. Despite whatever barriers or experiences we might have, um, there's, there's many of us have it in us to focus on hope. Uh, many of us have the, the, the energy level to, to turn to someone else and just have regular conversations, and, and that's where it starts. So thank you. Akiha and Togo. Um, just to really repeat, thank, I want to thank um, Representative Gallego and his entire office, um, Alexia, for putting this together. It's very important. Um, just really brief, um, a lot of black folks and people of color are dealing with mental health issues um, due to racism. And that's some things that we have to confront head on. Um, we as people of color, we as the oppressed have gone through many things over history that has brought this generational trauma, but all too often we work in separate silos. Um, it's time for us to start to work together and combine resources and understand that we do have a lot of commonalities when it comes to the things that we are dealing with. Um, and lastly, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to take a step back because um, you are important, you are necessary, um, and you are needed. Thank you. Well, first, I want to thank you again for um, Congressman Gallego for having me be a part of your panel. Um, and thank you, Alexia, for organizing this uh, panel and everyone, all the panelists on here for your insight and wisdom. Um, I also just want to say, you know, regarding domestic violence is that your life is more important than any um, person that might be trying to harm it, any family member who might be putting pressure on you, um, any belief that your faith is trying to keep you there. Um, you know, these things are unhealthy sometimes beliefs that we have. 
And I think it's important that you still hold on to your faith, still have relations with your family, but never to the point where you jeopardize your life staying in a relationship that can lead to your death. Um, so just to encourage you to reach out with people who will be supportive and who will be there for you, who will be able to provide resources, open up for you, um, and make your plans. Have your safety plan, keep it to yourself, and you don't owe explanations to anybody about when you make your move or how you make it, but know that your value and your life is more important than anything. So as you do that, just know there are services out there to help you, and I really hope that you are able to get those services if you need them. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. For those of you who did not get your questions answered, we will be responding to them via email, or if you have a follow-up question, please submit them to az07services at mail.house.gov or at our website, rubengallego.house.gov. This concludes our Zoom call. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time out of their day to provide more information on these important resources. And thank you to all our participants who joined this call. Please keep an eye on your email because after this call, we will be sending everyone a survey about this call and recommendation for future calls and topics. This call was also recorded and will be shared for everyone to view at a later date. Be safe and have a great evening, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>